Alright, hi y'all, welcome to Readable Porns, Watchable Reads, and I'm so sorry you're dragged into this mess. Anyways, today we're reading the, d this, the dick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna struggle, the dick hammering, decameron? The D-E-C-A-M-E-R-O-N by Giovanni Boccaccio, Boccaccio. But he has a lot of C's in his name, and it's very hard for me to pronounce because I've never studied this language before. Please don't hurt me. Anyways, getting into the book, I have no idea what it's about. I, it was pretty, so I picked it up, and I said, hey, I'm going to read this today, and I'm going to make you listen because, you know. Anyways, this is in loving memory of this lady. I got this from my local library. I support them. I would live and die for my library. Yeah. This is in reverse, but this is it. This is this is happening. We're flipping pages. Look how shiny it is. It's so shiny. I love it. Smells good. Okay. First day, the rule of Pampanea. <clears throat> Here begins a book called the the Decam. The Cameron, feel free to correct me, please, but be nice. Otherwise known as Prince Gala Halt, wherein are contained a hundred stories told in ten days by seven young ladies and three young men. Proem, Prom, P R O E M. <clears throat> to take pity on people in distress is a human quality which every man and woman should possess. But it is especially requisite in those who have once needed comfort and found it in others. I number myself as one of these, because if anyone required or appreciated comfort, or indeed derived pleasure therefrom, I was that person. Oh, this is just the editor's thingy, Majiki. And I mean, if you're into that, you can read it yourself. Um, the book is oh, translated by G.H. McWilliam with the woodcuts of Jose Naru, and they're really pretty. Look how look how pretty those are. Like, he did he did that. And there's like several others in there, and I'll show you the pictures because I'm like that. I'm not cruel. I'm a just and loving God. Don't I'm not I'm not a god, but um. Yeah. It says here, the woodcuts of Jose Naro. I'm probably saying that wrong. It's N A R O R O. No, 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 no. It's N A R R O. Originally appeared in a deluxe two volume edition of El de Camlo. Published in Barcelona by Ediciones Nauta, South America. Copyright 1966, and are reproduced with their kind permission. Translation copyright. G.H. McWilliam. It's 1972. Published by arrangement with <gasps> Penguin Books Ltd. London. Special contents copyright 1981. The Franklin Library. Printed in the United States of America. Anyways, moving on to the book book part of the book. Ah, uh, you know, the instruction. It's called The First Day. And here's the pictures. God, that's beautiful, isn't it? Look how sexy that is. That's a good, good-ass picture. Look at that dog. Holy shit, that dog's good. That's a good boy. I would trust him. Shit. <clears throat> Here begins the first day of the Decameron. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> and wherein first of all the author, and wherein first of all the author explains the circumstances in which certain persons who presently make their appearance were induced to meet for the purpose of conversing together. After which, under the rule of Pampanea, each of them speaks on the subject they find most congenial. That's one sentence. Hmm. This is going to be 
fun. Five minutes in. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Fairest ladies, whenever I pause to consider how compassionate you all are by nature, I invariably become aware that the present work will seem to you to possess an irksome and ponderous opening. For it carries at its head the painful... Were you naked? Were you naked? No. Are you naked? Okay. No, I'm not restarting. We're going in this whole, whole, whole ass, whole face, whole everything. We're whole ass in this shit. I will continue. You may close your door now, unless you would like to listen, in which you should do so silently. <clears throat> For it carries at its head the painful memory of the deadly havoc wrought by the recent plague, which brought so much heartache and misery to those who witnessed or had experience of it. <clears throat> Look us into the camera like I'm looking into your eyes, your soulful eyes. This is going to happen a lot. Deal with it. <sighs> but I do not want you to be deterred, for this reason, from reading any further, on the assumption that you are to be subjected, as you read, to an endless torrent of tears and sobbing. You will be affected no differently by this grim beginning than walkers confronted by a steep and rugged hill, beyond which there lies a beautiful and delectable plain. The degree of pleasure they derive from the latter will cor correspond directly to the difficulty of the climb and the descent. And just as the end of myrrh is heavy heaviness, <laughs> so, so sorrows are dispersed by the advent of joy. This brief unpleasantness, as I call it brief, and as much as it contained within few words, is quickly, quickly followed by the sweetness and pleasure which I have already promised you, and which, unless you were told in advance, you would not perhaps be expecting to find after such a beginning as this. Believe me, if I could decently have taken you whither I desire by some other route, rather than along a path so difficult as this, I would have gladly done so. I would gladly have done so. But since it is impossible without this memoir, memoir to show the origin of the events you will read about later, I really have no alternative but to address myself to its composition. I say, then, that the sum of 1348 years had elapsed since the fruitful incarnation of the Son of God, when the noble city of Florence, which for its great beauty excels all others in Italy, <clears throat> was visited by the deadly pestilence. Some say it descended upon the human race through the influence of the heavenly bodies, Others, that it was a punishment signifying God's righteous anger at our iniquitous way of life. But whatever its cause, it had originated some years earlier in the East, where it had claimed countless lives before it unhappily spread westward, growing in strength as it swept relentlessly on from place, one place to the next. <clears throat> in the face of its onrush, all the wisdom and ingenuity of man were unavailing. Large quantities of refuse were cleared out of the city by officials, specially appointed for the purpose all sick persons were forbidden entry, and numerous instructions were issued for the safeguarding the people's health, but all to no avail, nor were the countless petitions humbly directed to God by the pious, whether by means of formal processions or in any other guise any less infectual. <sighs> For in the early spring of the year we have mentioned, the plague began in a terrifying and extraordinary manner to make its disastrous effects apparent. It did not take the form it had assumed in the East, wherein, if anyone bled from the nose, it was an obvious portent of certain death. On the contrary, its earliest symptom in men and women alike was the appearance of certain swellings in the groin or arm. <laughs> I'm sorry, this was serious. <clears throat> this is a re-encounting of the 
events. <clears throat> in the groin or the appearance of certain swellings in the groin or armpit, some of which were egg-shaped, while others were roughly the size of the common apple. Sometimes the swellings were large, sometimes not so large, and they were referred to by the populace as Gavocioli. 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 G-A-V-O with an accent du grau. C-C-I-O-L-I. Sounds tasty. From <laughs> the two areas already mentioned, this deadly gua, gu, gavashiolo, that's a plural, I know that much, would begin to spread, and within a short time it would appear at random all over the body. Hot. Sometimes large and few in number, and at other times tiny and closely spread. These, to anyone unfortunate enough to contract them, were just as infallible a sign that he would die as the Gavoshilo had been earlier, and indeed, it still was. Against these maladies, maladies, if you will, it seemed that all the advice of physicians and all the power of medicine were profitless and unavailing. Perhaps the nature of the illness was such that it allowed no remedy, or perhaps those people who were treating the illness, whose numbers had increased enormously because the ranks of the qualified were invaded by people, both men and women, who had never received any training in medicine, being ignorant of its causes, were not prescribing the appropriate cure. At all events, few of those who caught it ever recovered, and in most cases, death occurred within three days. Three. Uno, dos, tres, un, dos, trois. I have this one. <clears throat> Within three days from the appearance of the symptoms we have described, some people dying more rapidly than others, dropping like flies and shit. I mean, more rapidly than others. The majority without any fever or other complications. They're just dying. We're just out here dying of the plague. Let's go. Let's continue. Let's dive into this a little bit more. We're almost, almost done with the introduction. I might read a few more pages. Yeah, I'll read to this. I'll read, I'll read this much more, because this is a lot. This is wordy. But we're going to do this. We're going to finish a goddamn book. <clears throat> because I have depression, and this helps. This is actually... <laughs> My way of battling my depression is just, you know, reading. Because I've not been able to pick up a book in a year. This is honestly the first book I've read in a year of my own vices. Um, and this is my way of making sure that I actually read the damn thing. Um, continuing on for my sad, mopey moments. But what made this pestilence even more severe was that whenever those suffering from it mixed with people who were still unaffected, it would rush upon these with the speed of a fire racing through dry or oily substances that happened to be placed within its reach. Nor was this society, was this the fucking shit motherfuck, nor was this the full extent of its evil. For not only did it infect healthy persons who had conversed or had any dealings with the sick, making them ill or visiting an equally horrible death upon them. But it also seemed to transfer the sickness to anyone touching the clothes or other objects which had been handled or used by its victims. Sad face. They die on all the plague. Y'all don't know this. I'm part Native American, so... My family's got a history of the plague. But, um... It is a mark... Moom, shoot. It is a remarkable story that I have to relate. And were it not for the fact that I am one of many people who saw it with their own eyes... I would scarcely dare to believe it, let alone commit it to paper, even though I had heard it 
from a person whose word I would, could trust. The plague I have been describing was of so contagious in nature that it very often it visibly did more than simply pass from one person to another. In other words, whenever an animal other than a human being touched anything belonging to a person who had been stricken or exterminated by the disease, it not only caught the sickness, but it died from it almost at once. To all of this, as I have just said, my own eyes bore wit witness on more than one occasion. I had a hiccup. So I was like, keep it in. I look really, really pale. This is the computer. There you go. Maybe I should put a lamp right here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe I'll just read two more pages. Okay. One day, for instance, the rags of a pauper who had died from the disease were thrown into the street where they attracted the attention of two pigs. In their wanted fashion... Wanted being a word, I don't know. The pigs first of all gave the rags a thorough mauling with their snouts, after which they took them between their teeth and shook them against their cheeks, and within a short time they began to writhe as though they had been poisoned. Then they both dropped dead to the ground, spread eagled upon the rags that had been thrown about their undoing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gay. So that's a funny word to me, spread eagle. You guys want to spread eagle me? Wink. I can't wink. Why do I keep trying? Wink. I tilt my head. Wink. Suffer with me. <clears throat> so the pigs died. They 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 got the clothes. They sneaked the clothes. The clothes had been infected with the plague. And they're dead. They're dead. That's all that's happening. So we can read. We can read a little more. They <clears throat> blue. Continuing. These things and many others of a similar or even worse nature caused various fears and fantasies to take root in the minds of those who were still alive and well, and almost without express exception, they took a single and very inhuman precaution, namely to avoid or run away from the sick and their belongings, by which means they all thought that their own health would be preserved. So, the plague travels through air. It travels through infection, it travels through clothes. But they didn't know that it travels through the air, too. So they're like, we'll just get away from them. Just lock them up, walk away, we're gonna be good, it's okay, we're just gonna walk away from them all. No, that's not how it works, honey. Honey? Anyways... Try not to use slurs. Um, some people were of the opinion that a sober and abstemious mode of living considerably reduced the risk of infection. They therefore joined, formed themselves into groups and lived in isolation from everyone else. Having withdrawn to a comfortable abode where there were no sick persons, they locked themselves in and settled down to a peaceful, exi peaceable existence, consuming modest quantities of delicate foods and precious wines and avoiding all excesses. They refrained from speaking to outsiders and refused to receive news of the dead or the sick and entertained themselves with music and whatever amusements they were able to devise. Others took the opposite view and maintained that an infallible way of warding off this appalling evil was to drink heavily, enjoy life to the full, go around singing and merrymaking, gratify all of one's cravings whenever the opportunity offered, and shrug the whole thing off as one enormous joke. Ha ha. Moreover, they practiced what they preached to the best of their ability, for they would visit one tavern after another, drinking all day and night to a moderate excess, or alternatively, and this was their more frequent custom, mind you, they would do their drinking in various private houses, but only in the ones where the conversation was restricted to subjects that were pleasant or entertaining. Such places were easy to find, for people behaved as though their days were numbered, and treated their belongings and their persons with equal abandon. 
Hence, most houses have become common property, and any passing stranger could make himself his home na as naturally as though he were the rightful owner. But for all their riotous manner of living, these people always took good care to avoid any contact with the sick. So, essentially, they're just avoiding it all. <laughs> all their problems and stuff. They're like, we're gonna party. We're gonna party hard, huh, bro. We're gonna, we're gonna party so hard. So hard, bro. No, no, no. We know with them. We don't know who they are. We're just gonna ignore them. They, they, don't, they don't exist. You know what Susie did last night? Yeah, she sucked this dick. They're just ignoring it. They're getting drunk. They're getting high. They're getting slizzard. Um, on the lizard, you know. Um, they're just avoiding it. Confrontation? What? Relatable, though. <clears throat> That's what I'm doing now. Avoiding it. In the face of so much affliction and misery, all respect for the laws of God and man have virtually broken down and been extinguished in our city. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> extinguished. For like everybody else, those ministers and ex- Executors, executors of the laws were not neither not either dead or ill, were left with so few subordinates that they were unable to discharge any of their duties. Hence, everyone was free to behave as he pleased. So basically, anarchy, anarchy. Basically, they were like, "Yeah, I'm gonna, you're not gonna stop us. We're gonna go and break the law. Because <laughs> what you gonna do? You're dead." <clears throat> there are many other people who steered a middle course between the two already mentioned, neither restricting their diet to the same degree as the first group, nor indulging so freely as the second in drinking and other forms of wantonness. That's a sexy word. Uh... But simply doing no more than satisfy their appetite. Instead... Of incarcerating themselves, these people moved about freely, holding it in their hands a posy of flowers or fragrant herbs, or one of a wide range of spices, which they applied at frequent intervals to their nostrils, thinking it an excellent idea to fortify the brain with smells of that particular sort, for the stench of dead bodies, sickness, and medicines seemed to fill and pollute the whole of the atmosphere. Basically, they're just putting stuff in their noses as a way to avoid the roses of bodies. Anyways, uh, that's it for tonight because I'm tired of reading my voice hurts. But if y'all will ever want any more of this, I'm probably going to upload more videos anyways. This is only my, I'm not doing this for views or anything. I'm not monetized. I'm just doing this to battle my own sick form of sickness. My own personal plague, if you will. I'm a fucking weeb. Yeah. Um. Anyways, it's just... My way of beating depression. One book at a time. But, um... It's something that was lost from me. The first few months, I could, you know, read a few pages, and then I stopped reading altogether, and I've not picked up a book for a year and a half until today. Um, I want to get back on to doing it. I want to read more. I want to do the things I used to love to do, and maybe try new things again. That's more about my executive dysfunction, <laughs> um, which has to do with my concussion. Um... But yeah, I want to get my life back, a page at a time. Alright, well, if you tell me what you think, correct my grammar, comment on it, give me some good vibes, please, or tell me you hate me, I, I can use that too. I got an ego the size of Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin is a state in America. America has too many states. Anyways, uh, yeah, just tell me what you think. Um, I don't know. Read along with me. That's why I told you the book. Again, the book is, and I'll put it in the comment thing, the little description, whatever, down there below. Um, it's the Dick 
Decameron, Decameron, De Decameron, Decameron, the D E C A N E R O N by Giovanni Boccaccio, Boccaccio, Boccaccio. I don't know. It's not a language I'm familiar with. But anyways, bye.